My struggle was anxiety for uh, most the majority of my life. Um, I struggled with it as early as the age of five, um, as far back as I can remember. And it's, it's been about 20 years of everyday struggle with anxiety. And it got to a point where I didn't trust God with it anymore. So there was a point that I stopped praying for him to take it away because I didn't believe that he would. And I couldn't conceive of living a life without anxiety. Um, and it got to a point where I didn't even want to leave my house. I was struggling to s just survive, um, and all of my energy was going towards that. I didn't, I remember telling my husband I didn't have any passion for anything. Sure, I was, you know, going to church and we were reading devotions, but it wasn't anything life changing because I was always gripped and chained by the anxiety. Um, and so there came a point where I knew I had to do something. Um, and, you know, th through various resources, now looking back, I can see that God had his hand on me the whole entire time and has led me through. Um, it's been an extremely long journey, um, but through God's hand, I have finally come to know freedom through Christ um, and from that anxiety that I struggled with every single day um, for 20 years, <laughs> you know, and, and that's not an exaggeration. Um, it's, it's a thing that I just figured was a part of me forever and now that through various resources that Christ has, has broken that wall, broken that concrete wall that I just could not break through. And it's not necessarily, he's gonna take it away um, one day and everything's gonna be fine. He uses people like um, Christian therapists. He uses uh, medications to help people. Um, there are many resources in which God works together um, to create that freedom. As a Christian, I'm not ashamed to say that because it's it's really Christ um, that's doing the work inside of me. And now I feel a passion inside of me to share with others. And you know, sometimes I question God, why did you let me suffer for 20 years? And um, now I can look back and thank God because now I have all of that energy to go towards serving other people and I have a passion for Him now like I've never had before and a love for others and it's just incredible and I owe it all to God. You know, for Leah, the idea of sitting in front of a camera and telling her story, there was a day when that wasn't going to happen. But she's in a different place. And one of the things we understand here at Shoreline is that God is on the throne and God is moving and working, and he works in lots of different ways. And God can use a Christian therapist and a Christian counselor, and God can use medication, and God can use friends, and God uses prayer, and God uses the work of the Spirit, and all that works together. And we have an enemy that's using any tactic he can to mess with us. God's going to use every, every possible tool to help us walk in freedom. That's what we're talking about today, is, is, is walking in the story of God's freedom. We started two weeks ago. Uh, we're walking through the books of the Bible. This is the New Testament. And if you're reading with us, then two weeks ago, you know, as we talked about the story of Jesus, we read the Gospel of Luke. And we read that portion of the New Testament where it tells the story of Jesus from, Luke, from kind of Luke's vantage point. And we saw the story of Jesus. Last week, we read the book of Acts and First and Second Thessalonians, and Pastor Dennis here in Monterey walked us through the story of the church. And I love when Dennis talked about the fact that he says, you know, if you were trying to make a movie of the story of the book of Acts, it's too big for, for it's, it, life, life is too big, it can't contain it, because there's so much going on with the power and the work of God among his people. And so God's story is unfolded in the story of Jesus this greatest story ever, then the story of the church. And today we're talking about the story of freedom. And what we're really looking at is this reality that this, this God we worship, this God who is his Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that God the Father looked at us, he looked at, at his children, and loved us, and wanted us to walk and to live in freedom. And he made a way for that to happen. 
He made a way for that to happen by sending his only son, Jesus Christ, Jesus who came and gave his life and died on the cross and rose again in glory to to win the freedom, to break the back of, of sin and hell and death and to set us free. And before Jesus left this earth, he said, I'm gonna send my Holy Spirit to live in you and to be with you. So if you're a follower of Jesus, the Holy Spirit of God lives in you and gives you power every day to walk and to live in freedom. To, and it doesn't just, just, like Leah shared in her testimony, it doesn't just happen. It's a journey of growing in that freedom that God offers to us. And, and so God the Father saw our need. God the Son paid the price. God the Holy Spirit is with us and in us. If you're not yet a Christian, you become a Christian, the Spirit of God moves in and will give you power to live in a whole new way. Now, as I was growing up, I didn't really, I grew up in Orange County in Southern California, and I didn't really think of the idea of bondage or slavery or, or you know, what, what it would, would mean to be shackled until a miniseries came on TV in my teenage years called Roots. And when this miniseries, how many remember watching this or saw this one? Okay, so this, and it was, it was powerful for me because I didn't think of human beings enslaving other human beings. That just wasn't part of my framework and that realization that, that people could live that way and be that way and, and be put into bondage and become slaves, that others would do that to them. It was heartbreaking. But it wasn't until I became a Christian that I discovered that there's another kind of, of spiritual slavery, another kind of bondage. So we can take that picture down now and just go, go to the, there you go. But, but there, there, there's more than just the, 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 the physical. There's also the spiritual, the emotional. There's all kinds of ways that we can be brought to a place of, of slavery. And so I want to just think for a moment about how some people are not walking in freedom, how they're, how they're living in bondage, how they're living in slavery. And I want you to quietly in your own heart ask God this question. Do any of these speak to me? Could it be that I'm not walking in the freedom that God wants me to experience? For some people, addictions become a form of prison. Addictions become a form of slavery. I don't want to, I hate it, but I can't stop. That's true in many people's lives. For some people, it's fear. Some people are paralyzed by fear. Small fears, big fears, but everything to them feels big and fear paralyzes them. For some people, it's past pain. Things that have happened in their past that they just can't get past their past now and they're stuck in it and they're present and they live in it every single day and it becomes paralyzing for them. For some people, it's guilt or shame. Boy, Satan loves to lock people in a jail of guilt and shame. And God comes and breaks the bonds and wants to set people free. For some people, it's temptation and sin. For some people, it's a sin in their life They're a follower of Jesus, they love Jesus, but there's a sin or there's a pattern that's just there and there and month by month and year by year. They battle, they pray, but they're still fighting against it or it kind of crops back up again and that becomes a form of spiritual slavery. For some people, they're enslaved to stuff. That's the technical biblical word is mammon, mammon, that Jesus says you can't serve both God and mammon. The word mammon means stuff, the things of this world. And sometimes we can be so in love with stuff and things and trying to possess things and get a hold of things and get more things and fix our things and take care of our things that our things begin to possess us and we're really not walking in freedom. For some, one of the things I've seen people in the, most, the greatest bondage of all is unforgiveness. People who've been hurt by someone else and they will not forgive. And their lack of forgiveness doesn't hurt the other person. Their lack of forgiveness puts themselves in a spiritual jail, an emotional jail, a relational jail. They can't trust other people for the future. They can't forgive the past, so they can't move forward. For some people, it's selfishness. Their prison is that they just always want more, 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 me, me, me. One of the things the Apostle Paul addresses in the books that we're gonna look at today, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, and Romans, is religious systems. There's people that become, become enslaved to religion. God sets us free, but religion can enslave us. If you don't do this, 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 just this way, and this way, and this way, then God doesn't love you. That's terrifying. And sometimes, sometimes and, and, and if, you really, if you really love God, you have to do this, this, and this, or maybe you're not a, you know, a really, don't really love him. And there's all these fears that can be built into religious systems. And God says, I want to set you free from that. So you live for me out of a free-hearted desire, not a fear. I want to pause for a minute and quiet our hearts and let you talk to God for a moment and say, God, right now in the quiet of my own heart, is there an area of my life right now that I'm in bondage? Is there something that's possessing me, that's controlling me, that has shackles on my heart or my soul or my emotions or my future? 
and just take a moment between you and God and just say, God, is there something in my life right now that has kept me in bondage? Talk with God about that for a moment. Our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you have come to set us free. And the enemy wants to put us in bondage and chains and lock us up in our past and in fear and in sin and all kinds of things, and you want to set us free. So speak to us today your word of freedom. We pray in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. If you look in your Bibles at Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, I want to read the passage. All of the pages in the books of the Bible in this book that we're using are also going to be on the screen so you can find the passages there as well. But in Galatians 5, verse 1, we read this. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and listen to this, and do not let yourself be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Christ came to set us free. And if you've come to the cross and you've received Jesus Christ, you're set free of your sins, you're set free of your past, you're set free of your, your shame, he sets you free. The one that Christ has set free is free indeed. If you're not yet a Christian and if you come to the cross, you will be set free. The problem is we can go back into bondage. We can go back into slavery. We can allow our hearts and our lives to be shackled to other things. But the goal of Christ's work on the cross was to set us free. And, and that's what God wants to do. Look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 23 and 24. And all through 1 and 2 Corinthians and Galatians and Romans, this theme of freedom comes up over and over and over again. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 23 and 24, we, we walk into a certain setting. The church of Corinth in the ancient world was in a very pagan area. Not, not only was you know, prostitution legal, but it was everywhere, and it was actually part of many religious systems. In the, the religious cult system, you could pay someone for, for sexual intimacy as part of your religious worship. That's, that's the kind of city that the people were living in. And the idea in that city at that time was, if you, and even the Christians were, people were saying, I can do anything I want. I'm free to do anything I want. And the Christians were buying into that. They're saying, my freedom in Christ is a freedom to do anything. As a matter of fact, the saying in the city of Corinth, the, kind of the mantra, one of the big sayings in Corinth was this, I have the right to do anything. Does that sound contemporary at all? <laughs> I have the right to do anything. It's my life. I can do whatever I want. Things don't change much through time. So the Apostle Paul writes to them, and he quotes what they're saying, and he tells them that they're wrong. He quotes and he says, I have the right to do anything, you say. You've taken on this mantra, this saying that's kind of part of culture at that time. I have the right to do anything, you say. And Paul says, but not everything is beneficial. If you have your own Bible, underline or highlight beneficial. He says, not everything is beneficial. Think about, does this benefit others? Does it benefit me? I have the right to do anything. He goes back to their quote again. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. Underline or highlight constructive. He says, not everything's beneficial, not everything's constructive. Then he says this, no one should seek their own good, but the good of others. You know what Paul's getting at here? He's saying true freedom is not a freedom that becomes a self-centered desire to get whatever I want. True freedom unleashes you to love other people. True freedom unleashes you to serve in a way that you couldn't when you're in bondage to yourself. True freedom isn't saying I get to do anything I want, when I want, how I want it. It's saying I can be the person God wants me to be. Sherry and I were in Australia about a year ago, and we did ministry in three different uh, parts of the country, and then we got at, at the, one, of, one of the locations when we were both together. At one point, we were in different parts of the country, and then we were together at one point, and this, uh, this person took us on this drive down the coast, and beautiful, but as we're driving along, beautiful drive right along the ocean there, but there were these signs, in Australia, we drive on the left side of the road, stay on the left side of the road, left side of the road only, like pictures and stuff, don't drive on this side, because people would come from places like this, where we drive on the right side of the road, which there is the wrong side of the road, and uh, you know, people would go on the wrong side of the road. And, it, and we got this one spot, this one beautiful spot, and there were these flowers and some crosses and stuff, and I said to him, what's the deal there? He goes, oh, that's a memorial for people that have been killed right there. I said, Really? He said, yeah, he says, what happened, this is, this is one of the most popular places in this part of the country. People come here first, and they're not used to driving on the left side of the road. So they pull right out into oncoming traffic. He says, there's all kinds of accidents right here. You know what we think sometimes? Freedom is doing whatever we want. But if you drive on the wrong side of the road, you're not free to do whatever you want. You're free to get killed and to kill someone else. I mean, think about it, right? We think freedom is doing whatever we want. It's not. Freedom is following God's path. Freedom is staying on the right side of the road and living the way God wants us to live. 
And, and what Paul is saying is, we're not set free to do whatever we want. We're set free to live fully for Jesus. But the Christians in Corinth were getting the message, I can do whatever I want now. And some of the sins they were committing were worse than the pagan sins. And Paul is saying, you got the wrong message. You're set free not to do whatever you want. You're set free to live fully for Jesus. Look at Galatians 5.13. In Galatians 5.13, we read this. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. Do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. He says, when you understand you're free, don't just do whatever you want that serves yourself, that serves your flesh and your desires. But I, but I love this language. But serve one another humbly in love. When I became a Christian, when I first became a Christian, I was part of a church down in Garden Grove, California. The youth group had about 1,000 students in it. They had to meet on two nights because the youth room only sat about 600 and they couldn't fit everybody in on one night. And there was probably 50 or 60 college students who were volunteering 10, 20, sometimes 30 hours a week to serve these high school kids and to try to lead them towards Jesus. I saw the freedom of Jesus in a generation of college students who said, in my free time, I'm gonna help high school kids love Jesus. I was blown away. So I'd been a Christian for like six, seven months and they said to me, hey, do you wanna volunteer and help with the youth ministry? And I watched, that's what everyone did. They all did. So I should, before I knew it, I was probably given 20 hours a week as a volunteer, as a senior in high school, helping out with other high school students. And it just seemed normal because I was free in Jesus and they were free in Jesus. And we just had this desire to serve God and impact our community. That's what happens in our hearts when we are really captured by the freedom of Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul gives us the source of the power for freedom. And the source of the power for our freedom is the gospel, the good news of Jesus. The gospel means good news. It's the story of Jesus. So here's what the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received... And on which you have taken your stand. Man, it's rock solid. You've taken your stand on the gospel. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I have preached to you. Otherwise, you believed in vain. He says, make sure you really know and believe this gospel. And then he says, here's what I'm talking about. Verse three. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures and that he appeared. He says, that's the story. It's the story of Jesus. It's the price he paid on the cross. God the Father saw our need and he sent Jesus Christ. Jesus died on the cross in our place for our sins to set us free and then he sent the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, God the Spirit who lives in us when we become Christians and goes ahead of us and prepares the way and who convicts us and challenges us and comforts us and empowers us to walk and to live in freedom. And so what happens is when we really understand the freedom of Jesus, here's what we discover. When you walk in Christ and the Holy Spirit's in you, there's some things that you're freed from, some things that have been part of your life or temptations to come to you say, I'm freed from that. I don't have to live in that anymore. You can walk, you're free to walk away from that. And there's some stuff you're freed to, to start doing. You can live in a new way, right? Some stuff you're freed from. I don't have to live that way. I don't have to do that. I don't have to think that way or act that way. I'm freed from that. And some stuff you're freed to that you couldn't do before. But now I can live this way and I can walk in this because I walk in the power of Jesus. And if you read, and many of you have been reading uh, First and Second Corinthians and Romans and Galatians this last week. If you haven't read it this week, you can start on page 177. I'll start you in next week's reading. But if you, if you haven't read this, and, and notice all the things we're freed from and all the things we're freed to. There's lots of them. I want to just share two examples of what we're freed from and two examples of what we're freed to. This is two of many that you'll find in this portion of the Bible. So here's the end. If you're a note taker, you'll see in your, in your bulletin, there's a place to write some thoughts down here. Freed from, what are, we have freedom from, here's the first thing, the paralyzing pain of the past. In Jesus Christ, you are freed from the paralyzing pain of the past, whatever that is, guilt and shame, hurt, being treated badly by people, stupid choices, sinful actions, all that. Christ says, I set you free from that. 
and I invite you to walk in a new way. The Apostle Paul is a great example of this. His past was a, was a past both of, of deep sin and rebellion, rebellion against God, but also of deep pain and hurt. He had been hurt deeply. And if you look with me at 2 Corinthians 11, you get a snapshot. This is a sliver of what the Apostle Paul suffered after he became a Christian and was a preacher serving Jesus. And while he served Jesus and preached Jesus, this is some of the stuff he faced. 2 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 23. The Apostle Paul says, I've worked much harder. I've been in prison more frequently. It's interesting. He uses a lot of numbers. When it talks about being in prison, he doesn't give a number. I think he forgot how many times he was thrown in prison. He'd go preach Jesus somewhere. People get upset. They throw him in jail. Lots of times. But I've been in prison more frequently. I've been flogged more severely. I've been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. He was, he was scourged 30, with 39 stripes five different times. 195 scars on his body because he served Jesus and preached Jesus. Three times I was beaten with rods. I don't even know what that leaves on your body. Three times beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. And once he was stoned, they thought he was dead. They threw him out on the junk heap. He was revived. He got up, went to the next city, and he started preaching again. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. And if you did the reading, you've read this. If you didn't, you can read in 2 Corinthians 11, and it go, the list goes on and on of what he suffered. The Apostle Paul says, I've been through all of this. And there's a point, isn't there a point sometimes where you just think, okay, at what point do you just crawl, in a ball, crawl up in a little ball, you know, suck your thumb and say, I've had it. <laughs> no more. At what point do you just go, okay, God, I'm serving you, I'm living for you, and I'm going through this. And, and the Apostle Paul says, no, no. He, he actually says, he says in Philippians 3.13, I forget what lies behind and I press ahead. Paul says, I, I've been through all this stuff, but I just, I just leave what's behind and I press on. I'm free from all that. So all of Paul's pain and suffering and abuse, he, he didn't forget it happened, but he didn't, he didn't stay shackled to that. He pressed on to serve Jesus. And also for the Apostle Paul in his past was his own sin. He had killed Christians. He had broken up churches. He had invaded homes and families and had Christians thrown in jail. Before he became a Christian, he hated Christians. He persecuted Christians. And he could have said, at one point he actually says, among all the people who are in the church leading and serving, he says, I'm like the worst of sinners. I persecuted the church. But I forget that. And I press on. I'm set free from that. What is your sin? What is your hidden dark sin? God could never use me. God could never work in my life because of you're not bound by that. Christ sets you free. And he says, now move forward. We're freed from paralyzing pain of the past. Whatever your past is, God says, I can deal with it. Follow me into the future. Freedom from. Here's the sec second one that's talked about many times in these books of the Bible. Freedom from sinful sexual seductions. Freedom from sinful sexual seductions. In the city of Corinth, in the ancient world, there was sexual temptation and enticements everywhere, and today is no different. In some ways, I think now accessibility to stuff is getting greater and greater, and those temptations continue to be there. But the Apostle Paul says, you don't have to live in that, you don't have to be that way, you can move into a different way of living. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 18 to 20, the Apostle Paul writes these words. Flee from sexual immorality. He says, run. Run from it. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. That's Jesus' death on the cross. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. He says, honor God with your body. Commit to purity. Man, in our world, that is tough because all that stuff's coming our way and all that stuff's put with, with a click of a button, images that are in front of our eyes, things that can fill our minds, things that can affect our behaviors. And we have to make a decision. I'm not going to live in that. I remember Sherry and I talking uh, before we got married about how we were going to handle the temptations of life the temptations of, of being in ministry and being around lots of people that are coming from different walks of life and different backgrounds. And we actually made a commitment to each other that if we ever felt sort of drawn to another person, 
And beyond just the, oh, that's an attractive, nice person, but we just started to feel that, you know what I'm talking about, the emotional heart connection that maybe there's something going on there that's not quite appropriate, that we would confess it to each other when it was just, just a thought or an emotional drawing and no action yet. We would, and we made a commitment to each other to confess that to each other, and we got to that point. And, and we made that commitment not thinking that it would happen to either of us. And a ways into our marriage, little kids, busy life, ministry's real busy, Sherry actually came to me. And she said, Kevin, this, I got to tell you, there's somebody that you know and that I know is a friend of ours who something in my heart's been happening. I've been starting to feel this attraction to that person. And when she told me, I actually said to her, I can totally understand that. Because it's a really super godly guy and loved Jesus, energy, just a neat person. So I, can, I say, I can understand that. Now, totally stay away from him. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> Don't look at him. Don't talk. You know, and, we, and we talked about boundaries and all that. You know, but, but she, she and, and, and once that was brought into the light, once that was brought into the light, it hadn't gone into action. It was just in the heart and the mind. It dissipated once it was put in the light. A few, few years later, same thing happened to me with somebody, who was a, somebody that Sherry knew and a wonderful, godly woman. And I found my heart starting to kind of wander. He said, well, you're a pastor. That can't happen to you. I'm telling you, it happened. And I went right to Sherry and I told her. And we talked about it. We prayed about it. And when we put it in the light, it went away. But you choose to walk in freedom. You choose to name things, to call things out, to confess things. Some of you might leave here and say, I can't believe our pastor said he, he struggled with that. I'm telling you, I, I, I'm telling you, I did, but she did first. No. Um, <laughs> um, I love my, I love, I'm crazy about my wife. Um, Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. We, need to all, we all need to hear this. We need to hear this. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind, to all people. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. We choose to walk in freedom. We strive to walk in freedom. Christ has set us free. Now in the power of the Holy Spirit, we are freed from certain things. We're freed from the paralyzing pain of the past. My past doesn't define my future. We're free, freed from you know, sinful sexual temptations. There's lots of them. And we have to, we have to put up barricades. I'll, I'll share a few things in a minute, just some ways to start to fight against those temptations. But we have to understand that God sets us free in Christ from many, many things. And he also sets us free to pursue certain things. So you see this in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, freedom to generous giving. One of the things that Christ does when he's in you and sets you free is he sets you free from just being possessed by your possessions and you can actually say, I can share what I have. The health of Shoreline Church, one of the most healthy things in our church is how many people are generous. The ministry we can do is amazing. Because God stirs people's hearts to be generous. And I celebrate that. Listen to 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 4. This is talking about a certain church and a group of people in this church who are so passionate about giving, they're begging for a chance to give. This doesn't happen very often. Please, 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 may I give, may I give some more. But this is what you're free to do in Christ. 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 4. Now, and now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, they're going through a tough time, with overflowing joy, their hearts are still joy-filled, and their extreme poverty, they're struggling financially, it welled up in rich generosity. All that combined became a chance to be generous. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own, unprovoked giving. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. They knew that there were needs in another region, and they said, could we please have the privilege of giving more? That's freedom. That's freedom. We live in a, in a world and a culture where we're possessed by possessions, and we're consumed by consuming. And Jesus says, you will be so freed in me and so satisfied in me that you're going to look and say, can I be part of that? Can I become generous there? We're freed from the pain of the past. We're freed from sexual temptations, and, we, and we, we then fight to walk in holiness, but we're freed to many, many things. One of them is just generosity. You can become more and more generous as God sets you free, and you walk in that freedom. And also, freedom to spirit-led service. We're freed to serve God and his church and our community led by the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 6, we read this. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, distributes them. 
There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord, that's Jesus. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them is everyone, uh, but in all of them and in everyone is the same God at work. You see, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit gifting us and calling us to serve. When you come to faith in Christ and the Holy Spirit lives in you and you're learning to be freed from the things that you need to walk away from and freed to the life that God wants, one of the things that happens is you say, how can I serve? Now, we think in our cultural perspective, well, if I'm free, then I'm free for people to serve me. And the Bible says, no, you're freed in Jesus to humbly serve others and find the joy of that, to humbly serve your community, your world. That's the heart of Jesus. And if the church will be consumed with Jesus and filled with the Spirit at that level where we say, God, how generous can I be and how much can I serve? That will change the world. That will change our community. And that's what God longs for us. When, when you understand the heart of the Father who looks at you and says, I want you to be free, so much that he sent his son Jesus, and when God the Son died on the cross to set you free, and the Spirit lives in you to empower you to walk and live in freedom, and now you start to live a whole new life. But it doesn't mean it's easy. It doesn't mean it's kind of, you know, snip, snap, you're there. And I, that's why I love Leah's testimony. She said it doesn't happen overnight. It was a journey. And God used lots of different ways to move me forward. So I wanna, if you're a note taker, I want you to write down these six things that this is kind of an overview of just some, some things to begin thinking about how to walk in freedom. If you have a specific area you want to talk to the pastor about, we're going to have three pastors. We're going to have Pastor Dennis and Pastor John and Pastor Sean up in the front after the service. And also call this week to the church and just say, boy, I'm feeling like I'm in bondage to this or that area. And I feel like I need to experience freedom. And we'll get pastors and LT members to pray for you. We'll resource you to the right place in the right situation to help encourage you to walk in freedom. Because it's a journey and sometimes it's a battle to walk in freedom. But here's some things to keep in mind. Six things. You can write these down if you're a note taker. If you want to walk in freedom, number one, don't start. Don't start things that put you in bondage. You want to be really smart and walk in freedom? Don't have to break loose from something. Just don't get started on it. You know when I quit drinking? I have five generations of alcoholics in my family. Five generations. You know when I quit drinking? When I was 13. I did. That's when I quit drinking. Because my grandmother sat me down and she said, you understand that your father, my oldest son Terry, will, is destroying himself with alcohol. She said, and his dad, my first husband, she said, was found in the gutter drunk and dead in New York City as a drunk, and she went back through five generations of my family. She looked at me, she says, don't be another generation of, she said, of men in this family who destroy their lives with alcohol. And I looked at her at 13, and I said, okay, Granny, I promise I'll never drink. Again, because I'd already drank earlier. But I said I would never, I said I would never drink again. And, um, and, and, I've, never, and I've never touched, and, you know, and it's easy. I'm free. You know why? I don't mess with it. I quit when I was 13. And so if, if some you younger people here, if there's something that is a real potential te temptation that can get a hold, for me, in my, my genetic makeup, from my dad and my mom's side, physiologically, I have a propensity and tendency towards alcoholism. I know that now. I didn't know that when I was 13. I just knew I wanted to honor my grandmother. But when I made that, I look now and I go, I'm so glad I didn't start because I think if I started drinking, I'd really like it. I think I'd have a problem. I'm a passionate guy. And so I'm thankful that I didn't start down there. There's some things you can just say, I'm not gonna do it. Number two, Pray. Pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome and to walk in freedom. Cry out to God and ask his spirit to fill you and to empower you and to convict you and to help you and to humble you to get the help you need. Number three, community. Walk in community. Don't walk, in, don't walk alone. When you're trying to walk in freedom, walk in, that's why we have growth groups. If you're not part of a growth group, think and pray about being part of, we're gonna have some new entry points for growth groups coming up and there's always, we're always looking for, you know, people wanna get in a group, we'll try to connect you in that, but get into a community of people or get two or three close Christian friends that will talk with you, pray with you, keep you accountable, challenge you, but get in community because it's hard to walk in freedom in our crazy world all by ourselves. Walk in community. Number four, get practical help. Get practical help. I loved Leah's testimony. She didn't just say, okay, so I, I struggled for 20 years and I prayed and poof, I was all better. She, she worked with great Christian therapists and she got the help she needed on multiple levels. She had community around her. She, she did all that she could because the, en the enemy will use any tactic to put you in bondage. He doesn't care what the bondage is or how he gets you there. He just wants you paralyzed. And God wants to set you free. So use every possible resource. And again, if you need to talk with somebody, talk with a pastor and say, man, I don't know how to deal with this specific thing. We'll, we can either help you or connect you with the right people or the right organization or the right ministry to get you the help you need. But we are here for you. So let us know if that's a need you have. 
Number five, never give up. Just don't give up. Some of you are back at a pattern or a habit that's paralyzing you and that has you shackled to it. And you say, well, I tr- stopped here or I tried here. Or I didn't for a while and I'm back there again. Then start again today. Let today be the day you say, today I want to walk in freedom. And come forth for prayer after the service or call us during the week and just say, I want to start walking in freedom and I need support. I need help. But, but, but if you fall back into a pattern, then say, today I start fresh again. And then number six, Praise. Every good step, every time you say no to past stuff, every time you turn away from it, you say, I'm freed from this, and you walk away from it and say, praise God, and you celebrate, just celebrate. The good, every step forward, rejoice. And then as you begin free to live in new ways and to love and to serve and to be generous and, all the, and, and to live for Christ, every step you take, say, I just rejoice and celebrate in your steps forward. And listen to this, rejoice and celebrate with each other. When you see somebody walking away from an old way of life and into a new way of life, which, by the way, is the whole life of a Christian, you're always walking from the old and into the new. Every day, every moment. And when you take that next step, you rejoice and let others rejoice with you and walk in the joy of that salvation. God the Father looks at you and me, looks at his children and says, I want you to live and walk and to be in freedom. God the Son died on the cross and bore your sins and paid the price and broke the, sin of, broke the power of sin and hell and death and Satan to set us free. And he sent his Holy Spirit to live in us. So God, the Holy Spirit, every moment says, I will give you power to be freed from the stuff that isn't good for you, and to be freed to a new life. But you have to walk in that freedom. You have to live in that freedom. You have to to strive forward, to keep picking yourself up and moving forward. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Walk in that freedom. Lord Jesus, we pray today that we will discover what it means to live and to walk in freedom, to strive for that freedom that you've already won for us to repent and confess when we stumble back into something again and to get up and begin fresh and new, knowing that you are there by your spirit to empower us for the next step of the journey. Jesus, thank you that you've made the way to freedom possible through your sacrifice, through your resurrection, through the price you paid for us. Spirit of God, thank you that you'd live in us and dwell in us and lead us on this journey of freedom. Give us the power today to walk in the freedom that Jesus won because he won it for us, and we celebrate this in his name. Amen.